Welcome back to another GTN Coaches Corner. Every Monday, we answer your triathlon training and related questions. Just fire in any question you like in the comment section below this video or any other video for that matter using the hashtag GTN Coaches Corner. And this week, I'm going to be talking about goggle issues, sweating and hydration, marathon training, and more. So let's do this. Philip Christopher Deke has asked, I've recently started doing some triathlon training or some swim training, um, and I bought my first pair of goggles. Unfortunately, I'm getting sick when I'm using them. Is it worth trying another pair or brand, or is it something that goes away from using it more? Generally quite sensitive, can't look down when I'm a passenger in the car, etc., etc. Um, well, congrats and welcome to the sport. Um, now, obviously, this could be a whole host of things, and I've got to ask, do you wear prescription glasses? in which case it obviously could simply be that and the eyes being strained making you feel nauseous and maybe giving you a bit of a headache, um, in which case you can get prescription goggles. Um, also, are the goggles too tight and therefore squeezing the head and giving you a bit of a headache and making you feel nauseous with that? Um, and then the other, which perhaps this could be um, the cause, is that the goggles you have just simply don't suit you, um, which isn't uncommon. Now for some, not being able to see fully around you could be making you feel this kind of car sickness. Um, essentially because you can't see around you, it gives you this slight tunnel vision and being, well, not a not being able to see what's in your peripheral vision can actually make you feel really uneasy and nauseous. Um, so i probably suggest just getting some goggles with a slightly wider field of view. Um, our channel partner Magic Fire, for instance, has really nicely angled goggles, so literally it feels like you can see the world around you. Added to that, they're custom, so they fit lovely into the socket of your eyes, so you can't really beat them. But yeah, have a look around at other goggles and perhaps just make sure that you haven't got this rim around them that's obstructing the peripheral vision and any extra vision looking down and ahead of you, because um, that might be causing a lot of it. Uh, but yeah, good question. Um, next one from Reese Fisher. Uh, what is the best way to work out sweat rate for 70.3 racing? Is it better to get sweat testing pack sent to you and do it yourself or get an exercise physiologist to conduct a sweat test? Um, there's a whole host of different ways you can test sweat rates and obviously differing levels of accuracy with that. Uh, the quickest and perhaps not the most insightful or accurate is doing it at home, doing a bit of weighing. So basically you weigh yourself pre-training session, you weigh the contents of your bottles pre-session, then you do a hard, long workout where you're gonna be sweating a lot. Then you weigh yourself post, the bottles post, you do a bit of calculation, subtract, etc., uh, and work out how much you've sweat. Obviously that only tells half the story and it doesn't tell you how much salt you have lost within that salt, that sweat that you have perspired. Uh, because some people sweat a lot, but the salt content in that sweat is very low and vice versa. Some people sweat very little, but the salt content is very high within that small amount of sweat. I unfortunately sweat a lot and lose a lot of salt in that sweat. So I need a lot of electrolytes when I'm training and racing. Uh, now there's quite a few brands out there that have a few different ways that they can help you. Um, I know brands like Precision Hydration, you can just jump on their website and you can fill in a quick questionnaire. Um, again, obviously it, it's relatively basic and, and they admit that themselves, but it may help you towards knowing what kind of electrolyte content you need to supplement your training. Um, there is obviously the non-exercise sweat testing, which is something I've done before. Um, this uses chemicals, um, you, you harmless chemicals to be clear, um, that are part on the surface of the skin and mimic um, certain neurotransmitters that then stimulate the sweat glands. It's collected in this little device and that can tell you how much salt you are releasing through your sweat. Uh, the next is patch testing, which obviously can be used during exercise, and that's probably a better method if you can get access to that, because you can actually just go about your normal training and really find out actually the sweat rate 
as well as the salt content. And then you can go the full hulk, you can go into the lab, you can do what's called a whole body wash down. I don't know the specifics of that, and I won't bother going into the details because I doubt many people really are gonna go to that extent. But yeah, have a look into those options for you. I would personally suggest if you can go and see someone for this, and I know some brands do offer this, you can go into some shops or some labs and they can just quickly do one of these patch tests, patch tests or non-exercise tests for you. Really, really good um, and will help you massively. Definitely has helped myself. Um, next question, Rakim Mod Arifin uh, said, hi there, to improve my VO2 max and my half marathon time, should I do 10 by 400 at four minute per K or 10 by 500 at 430 per K? Thanks in advance. Uh, very specific. Uh, now to be clear, specific VO2 training is different to half marathon training, but your VO2 max will improve with half marathon training. So to improve your half marathon time, it will require a lot more than simply just doing 10 by 400 or 10 by 500. Um, you should be doing something like 10 by 400, well above your half marathon target time, really sort of pushing that top end. But then to drive that threshold, and improve your VO2 max, um, then doing some threshold efforts or efforts around or just above your half marathon target time are really needed. So these could be much longer. You want to build these up with time, but these could be tens of minutes of long, tens of minutes long rather than just simply a minute or two at a time. Um, but yeah, sorry not to give more examples. I mean, this kind of requires a full training program. Uh, rather than one session that's going to do it all for you. Uh, right, next question, Anna Watkinson Powell. Um, how should I train for a marathon whilst also maintaining triathlon training? Most marathon plans involve running five times a week, but I worry about overtraining if I'm swimming and cycling as well. Which sessions are most important and should I do high intensity in all three? Um, this is a really common question, again, getting quite a lot of this at the moment as people are planning for next season. Now, depending on the timing of the marathon, yeah, it's likely you're not gonna to want to sacrifice too much of that triathlon training in place of the running. So yes, you will want to balance it and actually reduce the number of those runs. So yeah, don't just take one of those marathon training plans and try and fit that into your triathlon training. Um, that doesn't mean though, that you're not going to perform as well in that marathon because you're not doing as many runs. Let's not forget, swimming and cycling, you are still working that cardiovascular system and that is going to help towards the running, even if you aren't doing as many runs. In fact, you might find you do better than just a pure runner because you're probably doing more training than in total. And also it's that all round body strength that can help massively in things like half marathon and marathons. And now in terms of the runs that you wanna focus on, I would say focus on the tempo, progressive runs, those sort of like harder workouts that are focusing on maybe the marathon pace or there or thereabouts, uh, the long run, and then just any extra runs are just simply easy. Uh, the key though, obviously, as you've alluded to, will be the balancing with the swim and bike training. Yes, you still wanna make sure you're getting in some intensity in the swim and the bike workouts, but just balancing it and making sure you put those in on the right day so that you're not doing too many hard workouts at one end of the week or on certain days. So yeah, really try and balance that one out well and do keep an eye on your recovery and how well you're performing. Just make sure, yeah, factory in maybe phases to your training so you are having a day off every few weeks or a few days easy every few weeks. Um, right, next question, uh, Virage Meta. When I'm going at a hard pace, tempo thrash slash threshold, my legs are working quite hard, but my breathing is still in zone two, and I'm, re I'm getting passed very easily by people who are just coasting in worse bikes. After, bike, after the bike, my legs feel dead, but breathing and heart rate is so normal. Why is that? And how can I make it so that my cardio respiratory system is working as hard as my legs? Uh, two things jump to mind here. Position on the bike, and I don't mean just in terms of aerodynamics, I mean, is your position hampering the performance of your legs? If you're in a really uncomfortable position, your, work, your legs could be working overtime um, just simply because they're cramped up, they're uncomfortable, and therefore they're struggling, but actually the rest of your body can't push any harder because 
the legs are just doing all they can in that horrible position. The other is potentially overtraining. Uh, sometimes as a result of overtraining, it's hard to actually get your heart rate up. Your body could feel really tired, but actually it's really hard to get going and get that heart rate up. Um, otherwise, I mean, you do say that your breathing is still in zone two. Um, now, all I gotta say, like sometimes if I'm in zone three or zone four, my breathing may still be the same rate as when I'm in zone two, but I'm just breathing a bit harder. Um, fortunately, I can't answer that anymore, but the kind of the key one that's jumping out to me is potentially the position on the bike. And I think this is quite common for a lot of people, which is why I thought I'd answer this question. Just have a look at that position because sometimes you almost can be fighting the bike and the position and legs working a lot harder than they need to be. Uh, final question from Jonathan Gonzalez said, planning to use a gravel bike for a short course triathlon um, and trying to do it on a budget. What gravel bike would you recommend for a short course triathlon? Well, again, awesome, well done for trying to do a triathlon. Um, first question I guess is, why do you want a gravel bike? Is it assumedly because, or presumably because you want to have one bike for all? Um, because gravel bikes aren't necessarily cheaper than a road bike or triathlon bike, but I'm presuming you want the gravel bike so you can do a, a little bit of gravel riding on the side of doing the triathlon. Um, if you do get a gravel, gravel bike, just try and get something that isn't crazy. You haven't got these massive, funky, weird handlebars, which you can sometimes get on gravel bikes, and also isn't too bulky around the forks or on the frame. Get something that's relatively aerodynamic, if possible. Um, and then, when it comes to doing the triathlon, I would really recommend swapping out the tires at a minimum, so you're just improving the rolling resistance of the bike or reducing the rolling resistance of the bike. And if you can, maybe borrowing some wheels from a friend, they're probably gonna be a little bit lighter with that. Um, and that will, yeah, drastically improve the speed of the bike on the road. Uh, but yeah, really good question because a lot of people will be entering triathlons this next year and maybe just trying to do it on a budget using a bike that they've already got. And yeah, there's some, there's many ways that you can just quickly improve that bike without having to necessarily get a new one. Uh, some fantastic questions there today. I hope you've all enjoyed it. If so, please do give it a thumbs up, give it a like, and don't forget to subscribe down below.